Sarah Pace is a research associate at the University of Southern Mississippi's Gulf Coast Research Lab, where she manages the Dermo and Oyster Mortality Monitoring Program in the Mississippi Sound. She is also involved in various shellfish research programs funded by the Science Center for Marine Fisheries, investigating age and growth dynamics of ocean quahogs and Atlantic surf clam populations. So thank you so much, Sarah, and off you go. All right, well, thank you for that introduction, Danny, and thanks everyone for tuning in today. Uh, today we're gonna be talking all about oysters, uh, specifically the Eastern oyster, Chrysostria virginica, these oysters have a range from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico, including the Caribbean islands, uh, Central America, and parts of South America. These oysters inhabit salty and brackish water. Uh, their optimum salinity range is between about 15 and 30 parts per thousand. Though oysters can tolerate salinities outside of their normal range, but their salinity uh, tolerance is temperature dependent. So in colder temperatures, oysters can survive low salinity for longer extents. But the combination of high temperature and low salinity often proves to be lethal to oysters. Oysters can tolerate freshwater for short periods of time. In fact, flood events that are short in duration can be beneficial. And this is because flooding brings in nutrient-rich water, which promotes the growth of phytoplankton, which is really great for oysters because they're filter feeders, feeding primarily on plankton and organic detritus. Like I said, things like uh, algae, dinoflagellates, eggs and larvae of other marine invertebrates, even um, pollen from terrestrial sources. And as filter feeders, one adult oyster can filter about 50 gallons of water per day. You may have uh, heard oysters being referred to as a keystone species, and this is because oysters provide habitat complexity, they can improve water quality, and they provide food for a range of commercially important species. And so the presence of oyster reefs in an area increases species, species richness, uh, abundance, and diversity. Oysters are reef builders. You may also hear reefs referred to as bars or rocks or oyster beds. Uh, they can be near shore. These tend to be uh, intertidal, which means they're submerged at high tide, but they're exposed at low tide. And there are also offshore reefs, which are subtidal, so they're submerged all the time. As for reproduction, oysters are broadcast spawners, which means that the males and females release eggs and sperm into the water column simultaneously. Um, warm water temperatures trigger spawning events in addition to other environmental cues such as salinity. Oysters have a prolonged spawning season, but spawning typically peaks in the spring and fall in the Gulf of Mexico. And there are a couple stages that follow fertilization. Um, the first larval stage is referred to as the trochophore stage. This lasts about two to three days. It's when they first develop a ciliated girdle, which allows them to swim. After which point they develop a vellum, which is a swimming and feeding organ. And at this stage, they're called the veliger, and they remain in the water column for um, anywhere between two to three weeks. And then they develop a foot and an eye, and at this point they're called petty villagers, and that, that foot and eye allow them to search for a suitable, sed suitable sediment substrate. And since these animals spend, the, the larvae spend so much time in the water column, the dispersal of larvae is largely controlled by currents and tidal exchange. So larvae prefer clean sediment substrates such as live oysters, and they really like to settle on the inside of recently dead oysters, which we call boxes, because these are oysters that have died, but the shells are still articulated, so it's a nice protected area for the larvae to, to settle down. And once that petty villager does pick a spot and cement itself, we now refer to those baby oysters as spat. As for their development, uh, oysters are protandrous hermaphrodites, which means that they first mature as males and then later change to females. And oysters do have the ability to revert back to males, although this isn't very common. And oysters can grow very rapidly. They can uh, reach market size, which is three inches in um, between one to three years, depending on location. So not only do oysters need to reproduce to maintain their populations, but they also need to continually contribute to the reef structure. So we've got our cool live oyster over here. And so the death of oysters creates a positive feedback loop because it increases the amount of shell that's available on the reef. So the dead oysters are contributing now to the reef framework. And so the larvae can choose if they want to settle on live or dead oysters. And um, this fosters 
So the addition of the dead shell fosters the increased settlement of larvae, increasing the likelihood that they will now grow up into adulthood where they can die and contribute to the reef. However, when more shell is lost and added to the reef, a negative feedback loop is created uh, as recruitment is reduced. You can see there's, there's less uh, surface area available for the larvae to settle on, which means that fewer larvae are going to grow up into adulthood. And that means that fewer lar uh, adult oysters are going to die and contribute to the reef framework. So now we're in this negative feedback loop. And in addition to natural processes, uh, we must also consider the effect of fishing as fishing removes live animals, which means that there are less adults available to contribute to reproduction. So we're removing the brood stock and we're removing um, suitable sediment substrate for larval sediment because as I said, they prefer live oysters, which we're removing. And they really like the inside of dead oysters, but if we're taking away all the live oysters, we have less oysters dying and contributing to the reef. Adding further complexity to the recruitment situation, um, oyster shell is not a permanent resource. Taphonomic processes such as bioerosion, abrasion, fragmentation, and chemical solution, dissolution all act on the shell surfaces, and oyster shells degrade pretty rapidly compared to other types of uh, molluscan shell. The half-life of oyster shell has been estimated to be between three and 10 years, um, and some of our recent work has suggested that um, in the Mississippi Sound, the half-life could be anywhere between about 2.6 to 5.1 years. So that's, that's pretty rapid. Um, these images, so this top image is shell from the past Christian Reef. Um, quick quack story, in 2016, there was a mass mortality event. Some of our sample reefs recovered, this in particular did not, but prior to the mortality event, this site was composed mostly of large live animals. You would, you would pull up a dredge toe and 90% would be live oysters and 10% would be um, colch and, and other shell. So then they all died and no more oysters were being uh, added to the reef. We pulled this top image, uh, these shells out about a year after the mortality event, you can see that the shell is still intact, but it's covered in a film. This is really not great for larvae to settle. And then um, in 2019, from the same site, these shells would have died in the mortality event. You can see they're already riddled with holes, all the, they're fragmented, they're chipped and broken. So in Mississippi, um, oyster shell breaks down pretty rapidly. And shell loss from degradation likely exceeds shell gain in oyster reefs worldwide. An estimated 85% of oyster reef habitat has been lost since the 1800s. And uh, to put that in perspective, it's thought that the Chesapeake Bay oysters could once filter the volume of the bay, uh, which is about 19 trillion gallons of water in less than one week. Some estimates suggest as quickly as three days. And today it takes about one year to filter an equivalent volume of water. And as sessile organisms, um, so they can't move around. Oysters are particularly vulnerable to disturbances. And some common ones that we have in the Gulf are hurricanes and tropical storms. And these can destroy oyster reefs uh, through a couple mechanisms. Strong currents and wave action can remove shell material or bury reefs due to sedimentation. Uh, so currents and waves are kicking up sediment and uh, onshore flooding can increase riverine sedimentation. And this can bury reefs. And additionally, heavy rainfall and flooding can alter local salinity, which can be detrimental to oysters. Another common disturbance results from freshwater diversion. Um, so diverting water to an area that would normally not receive high inputs of fresh water can result in flooding and reduced salinity. Some of you may be familiar with the uh, situation that occurred with the Bonnet Carey spillway last year. Um, the prolonged opening of this spillway devastated oyster reefs in the western uh, Mississippi Sound and much of the Louisiana marshes. Um, we have seven sample sites and there was 100% mortality at all the sites and even a year later recovery is limited to non-existent. And similarly diverting um, water away from an area which would normally receive fresh water can increase salinity and this can increase the uh, presence of oyster predators, things like oyster drills, crabs, rays. Uh, these animals prefer higher salinity, so if you increase that salinity, they're gonna, more uh, predators are gonna be around, so more oysters are going to die. 
Oil spills are another issue. Um, oil compounds such as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs and dispersants, which are chemicals used to break down oil masses, can cause harm to organisms, though oil compounds seem to have little effect on the immune function of adult oysters. And so even though adult oysters pretty readily take up hydrocarbons, they're pretty effective at um, excreting them, and they do this through reproduction. So eggs and sperm contain up to five times more hydrocarbons than the adult body tissue. And um, so the high levels of hydrocarbons in these gametes could potentially affect larval development, but it's um, to the benefit of the adults to get rid of these hydrocarbons, though it may be compromising to that particular spawning event. And uh, exposure, exposure to dispersants at an early age may have a negative impact on fertilization and development because these dispersants can be pretty toxic. What other challenges do oysters face? Uh, hypoxic events are pretty common in the Gulf. Uh, these are situations where there's low or even depleted levels of oxygen. And this can result from uh, stratification in the water column due to salinity or temperature gradients that prevent mixing or from eutrophication, which is um, when the environment becomes enriched with nutrients. This promotes the growth of algae, which leads to algal blooms, and then that algae dies, sinks, is consumed by bacteria, and in the process, the bacteria use up all of the oxygen uh, while eating the algae. And so now the oysters are stuck in an area with no oxygen. And of course, uh, well, we must consider the effect of diseases on oysters of particular concern in the Gulf is Perkinsis marinus, a pathogenic protozoan known as dermo, which it can cause an estimated 50% mortality among market size oysters in the Gulf every year. So it's a pretty significant source of mortality. So much of this has probably sounded uh, pretty grim, but there is some good news. Uh, oysters are remarkably resilient to disturbance events due to their life history strategies. As I said, oysters grow really rapidly. In the Gulf, they can reach three inches, which is a, a harvestable size, in 18 to 24 months. Oysters reach maturity pretty rapidly in about four weeks under optimal conditions. And their prolonged spawning season gives these animals the chance to replace lost oysters, oysters lost in mortality events. So if there's a mortality event, maybe in the springtime, if some oysters survive, there's a chance that they're going to uh, reproduce and contribute, and you can have a successful recruitment event shortly after a, a mortality event. So why is oyster restoration so important? Um, it's, people love to eat oysters, so it's a major commercial fishery, and it's important to our economy. And as I said, oysters improve water quality and can improve the clarity as they filter out the plankton and algae and other particles. Additionally, oyster reefs act as a natural storm barrier by dissipating wave energy. Um, erosion is a pretty big problem around our coasts and nearshore reefs can help prevent erosion. And one way that we commonly try to fight erosion is by building seawalls, but seawalls don't take into account sea level rise. Whereas uh, if you build oyster reefs instead of a seawall, um, that those reefs are going to continue to accrete and build as sea level rises. So it could be a really good option um, in lieu of seawalls. And oysters provide habitat and pr protection for hundreds of other species, things we like to eat and fish for, like blue crab, flounder, shrimp, speckled trout, and the list goes on. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass things off to Jenny. Thanks again for tuning in. And uh, 